Fearless Women is sponsored by the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission. Hello, I'm Rob Casper. I'm the head of the Poetry and Literature Center at the Library of Congress. I'm here in the members room of the Jefferson Building in the Library of Congress's Capitol Hill campus. I'm thrilled to be talking to two of our greatest poets laureate, uh, Rita Dove, who was the seventh poet laureate consultant in poetry, and Joy Harjo, who is our current and 23rd poet laureate consultant in poetry. Welcome to you both. Thank you, it's great to be here. Yeah. Thanks, it's really good to be here, especially with you guys. Yeah, well, I'm thrilled to have you and uh, I'd love to know where you're talking to us from. Well, I'm talking to you from my study in my home in Charlottesville, Virginia. And this is where I, it seems I'm spending all my time, even <laughs> though there's a house around me, but it's my area in certain ways. That's where I am. Okay, I'm uh, I'm in Port Townsend, Washington, at the edge of the world, literally the ocean, and uh, I'm up here recording a music album with poetry, of course. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you both for making the time to talk to us and to talk to all the viewers who are coming to the National Book Festival. Before we begin our conversation, I would love to have you both read a poem. So maybe Rita, you could start. Okay. Um, I know you asked me to read a poem from my my last book, which was my collected, um, and so that was a little difficult. But I I thought this one because of where we are today in the world. It's called All Souls. Starting up behind them, all the voices of those they had named: mink, gander, and marmoset crow and cockatiel, even the duck-billed platypus of late so quiet in its bed, sent out a feeble cry signifying grief and confusion, etc. Of course the world had changed for good, as it would from now on every day with every twitch and blink. Now that change was de rigueur, man would discover desire, then yearn for what he would learn to call distraction. This was the true loss. And yet, in that first unchanging instant, the two souls standing outside the gates, no more than a break in the hedge, how had they missed it? Were not thinking. Already the din was fading. Before them, a silence larger than all their ignorance yawned, and this they walked into until it was all they knew. In time, they hungered down to business, filling the world with sighs. These anonymous, pompous creatures, heads tilted as if straining to make out the words to a song played long ago in a foreign land. Mm. Wow. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to read, I know it kind of fits in a way with what you're reading. I was thinking a lot about how blues and jazz, uh, all of that came about in a time very much like this one. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't know that Ta Congo Square was a Muscogee Creek village, Homa, they were Muscogee, Muscogee village. And you could just see everybody getting together, all the the African tribal people. And then there was, of course, New Orleans has always been a place people, you know, that gathered natives long before the French came, Bienville, and, and and then, you know, here are the African people and the people coming up from the islands and it all came together. But uh, I used my poetic license and uh, Rabbit is a trickster figure for many West African tribal groups and also for our Muscogee Creek people. And I figured if anybody, I know that um, 
Adolf Sax invented the saxophone, but uh, and I thank him every time I play. But um, I say Rabbit invented the saxophone, the trickster. <laughs> so it's a little route, it's a little different, but Rabbit invents the saxophone. When one of the last trails of tears wound through New Orleans, Rabbit, that ragged trickster, decided he wanted to be a musician. He was tired of walking, and they had all the fun, they got all the women. Fans gave them smokes, drinks, and he could have all kinds of new friends to do his bidding. But Rabbit hadn't proved to be musical. When he let it stomp dance, no one would follow. No shell shaker would shake shells for him. He was never invited to lead, even when the young ones were called up to practice. The first thing a musician needs is a band, he said to his friends. The hottest new music was being made at Congo Square. So many tribes were jamming their African native and a few remnant French, making a new me music of melody, love, and beat. Rabbit climbed up to the stage but had nothing to offer, just his strut, charming banter, and what looked like a long stick down the tight leg of his pants. Musicians are musicians. No trick will get by. You either have it or want it. Nothing else will fly. Do you know any songs? What can you play? Can you sing? Do you have a piano, tuba, or strings? The musicians began vamping. What can this rabbit cat do? Is he going to blow hot air or fart in the rain? Rabbit turned back his back to the band like that genius Miles Davis. Pulled out his stick. He made a horn with his hands. His stick is so special, bragged Rabbit, as he turned back to the jam. No one else has one like this. You've never heard it before. It's a sax o o phone. Rabbit's newborn horn made a rip in the sky. It made old women dance and girls fall to their needs. It made singers of tricksters, tricksters of players. It made trouble wherever it sang after that. The last time we heard Rabbit was for my cousin's run for chief. There was a huge feed. Everyone showed up to eat. Rabbit's band got down after the speeches. We danced through the night and nobody fought, nor did anyone show up the next day to vote. They were sleeping. Mm. Wow, thank you both. Uh, before I ask you about uh, your relationship and about the position, I think it'd be great to just reflect on those two poems and the connections they might have with one another, uh, how they might play off of each other. I'm wondering what you two think about how those poems and poems in general uh, engage with, contend with, reimagine myth. Mm. What what I what I I loved about Joy's poem was how she made us look anew at what discovery is, and something that we think of as completely uh, everyday object, a saxophone, becomes this magic stick, uh, and 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 so it. it it makes us, and I think poetry does that so often, it makes us look at things anew, afresh, mm -hmm. and suddenly there is magic everywhere uh, if we know how to look for it. Which I think is true in the poem you were reading too, and that's I've always loved that poem because you, you do go down into, you know, like the primordial, <laughs> you know, to that primordial uh, yeah. scene. And uh, and it pulls up exactly what we need, you know, even though it may have been written, you know, two years ago, five years ago, the poems, I think poems come before, they often come before their time. I've mm -hmm. noticed that in poetry too, that they don't always make their um, play, you know, it takes a while because yeah. in poetry you're dealing with time, you deal with so much with time I'm thinking a lot recording and then you get into a place of timelessness mm -hmm. and your poem has that sense of a kind of timelessness about it. And yet it works perfectly in time for now. Thank you. It, it as does yours. I mean, both poems are about naming things too. And in that moment before they're named, everything can be anything, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then they get, get named and they, we take agency over them, whether it's a sex or wolf or, you know, or not. And, and, and it is true that poems, I mean, they exist in a space that's beyond the person who created them, mm -hmm. right? Well, let's talk a, lot, a little bit about uh, the two of you 
and your relationship. Uh, you've known each other a long time, and I wonder if you could tell us about uh, where you first met and how your friendship started. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's been, that time gets longer and longer in the past. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's true. We met in graduate school. We met in Iowa. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we kind of met, uh, both of our eyes were downcast at that point. Yeah, that's so, true. I mean, we were just slugging through a, a, a space where there was very little kindness or openness, and yet we were supposed to be writing poems that opened up into benevolence. It was strange. It really was, and I didn't even, I started writing Not Me for a while, and then I finally said, you know what, whatever, whether it's accepted or not, I have to go with what was given to me. Mm -hmm. Where I am, I'm developing it, and I found it to be a great place for getting to hear and develop my ear and all of that, but yes, you're right. You know, we we were not, I was, I know for me, I wasn't always present because I did not feel myself in mm -hmm. that space. But then when I saw you walking alongside and then Sandra Cisneros was there and there was a uh, Gail Harada. Yes. I remember her and others and we were kind of all in that space, but not, you know, I, I remember thinking, well, I know, you know, I know I went there, I had all kinds of offers in other places with money and position and they didn't offer me anything. But I knew, I don't know, I went, it was important in a lot of ways, I think, because I learned how to to uh, let my voice be what it is. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I felt that um, it was the toughest proving ground that I could have had and nothing since then, no literary, you know, arguments or flare ups or nothing has compared to that. I think it really prepared me for that. And it also though prepared me, as you said, Joy, that to find my own voice and to recognize what it was. Yeah. Uh, because, um, you know, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot though. I also, you know, kind of ached a lot too, but yeah. Um, yeah, one of the saving graces, and that was a space I remember where I f where first began to uh, talk to one another because Iowa was a place where you were afraid to even talk to other yeah. people. Was at, just across the hall at the International Writing Program. I love that program. Yes, because <laughs> it those were real writers. Uh -huh. been writing and living their lives. And they, they thought all these petty, you know, fights over across the hall at the workshop was just, they thought it was a name and, and treated it as such. And, and then you saw people who were living the full of their lives, right? It was, it was fantastic. Yeah. But the I two of you that. were. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rob. The two of Rob. you were, were presumably sharing poems and in classes together and can you talk maybe about that kind of exchange that happened just with the two of you and with Sandra Cisneros too? I don't remember talking in, in class much at all, but I would go over to the International Writing Workshop and hang out. Bessie Head was there. They had all these writers. I became good friends with Leona Gusta from and Denarto from Indonesia. Yeah. and kept up a friendship, you know, with with writing. And so I felt more. I think we probably exchanged our writing more maybe outside the outside the workshop yeah. personally that's you know outside yeah i remember telling myself that i would say one thing in workshop every workshop just to put you know and, then, and i would actually kind of think of what i was going to say yeah. I, I was shy and then this the workshop was like a, really was a battleground there was so um, we, I would say that one thing, and I remember, Joy, when we were in a workshop together, basically, we didn't talk to each other. We just yeah. sat, and we made sure we didn't sit next to each other because there was one of each, um, you know, there was one, you know, there was Sandra, there was you, and there was me, and we just made, I think, instinctively, we said we're going to spread ourselves out. But um, <laughs> yeah. you take this side, you go by the door. <laughs> yeah. And then you sit over there. <laughs> but at the International Writing Workshop, that's where we could laugh and we could talk and we could, you know, talk yeah. about everything. Um, and of course, I met my husband there. That was kind of nice. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Yeah. I love her. Yeah. 
But you still <laughs> love birds, yeah. Yes, we still are. But yeah. uh, I don't know. Um, yeah. And later on, we all got together and realized that we yeah. were all, we all felt the same way, rather beleaguered, but just pushing through. And yet we, I mean, I used to think that both you and Sandra were so cool and calm and collected. And I was a bundle of nerves. And then you said, no, we thought you were cool and calm. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and did you continue sharing poems and talking to one another after school? Not really. I think we went about, we went about probably very different lives in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting thing. I mean, there's, I think there's always this kind of fairy, not fairy tale, but a myth being floated that, you know, writers are sharing their poems. Across. And, and yet we didn't, but I always felt connected. It's, it, yeah. it's interesting. Every time we saw each other, it was like this thing. And um, I followed Joy's career and I followed, I read her poems and books and I said, oh yeah, she's, doing it, you know, and I, and I felt that uh, in a certain way we were sharing poems, but we weren't sharing them before they were finished for the world. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of leading different lives, you both uh, were appointed uh, uh, Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry, this position at the Library of Congress. Um, Reader, you were appointed in 1993 um, by Dr. James Billington, and um, Joy, you were appointed in 2019 by the current librarian, Dr. Carla Hayden. Uh, but m for the purposes of the conversation, I really want to talk about what it meant to be appointed at very different times in your lives and uh, how that affected you, how you negotiated that. And maybe Rita, you could talk about it. You were in your early 40s, right? Oh, now you're going to force me to do math. I suppose so. <laughs> I don't know. Yes, I was in my early 40s. Um, yes, very early 40s, 40 to 41, 42. Um, and, and I was at a point in my life where I still felt I had a lot to say and I wanted to say it. And interesting, I mean, when I was appointed poet laureate or when, when I got the call, I remember thinking, well, there goes my summer of writing. I mean, I really, the first thing I thought about was that I wasn't gonna be able to write very much. And at that point in my life, I, I couldn't figure out how to, still couldn't figure out how to separate public from private. I'm not very good at it now. Uh, but so and literally it was a, a, a kind of a sacrifice, uh, but, but, I, but I gladly made it because I also realized that, that to have someone who looked like me, my age, my race, my gender, that this was so important and it sent a signal to the country and that um, I, you know, I needed to just step up to the plate. And so I did. Uh, luckily at that time, I think the atmosphere in the country, people were ready for, for poetry. It was a, a you know, kind of second Camelot period um, mm -hmm. in, in modern American history. And, and so I could, go out and be really present and just, just kind of be there and bring poems wherever I could. Uh, and uh, people were open and ready to receive them. I and mean, I, I remember ha having luncheons with, uh, you know, Republicans, the I Heart Republicans talking about, about poetry in a very amicable manner. I don't know what it's like today. Yeah. So I George, do you want do you want to do you yes, want to, so to you. <laughs> I'm slow on the slow on taking my cue here. Uh yes, yeah, so of course you don't expect it, you know, and a lot, yeah. you know, when that call came from uh Dr. Carla Hayden and and uh, Rob had put me on that call and it's like lightning, it felt like lightning. Yet all this stuff goes through your mind and it's like, well, you know. I mean, I had to do, it's for the same, a similar reason I had to, it was something that was, it was really, it's about the poetry, but it's not really, it was something for for the people. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, we're here to serve, whether we're in this position or whatever we do, we're all in the position to serve, to serve poetry, yes. to serve the people, and it all happens within the time. So my laureateship came at a, I'm, I'm older, I won't do any math, I already know the math. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm older. I'm not going to say, yeah. 
<laughs> I'm all, yeah, you know, which is probably good in my case, you know, mm -hmm. and I've learned a lot between if I, you know, where you would have been younger, but um, it, it certainly has come at a very crucial time in the country where, you know, much, there's a lot of division where people need poetry. I mean, and then the pandemic hit and, you know, then the importance of speaking beyond what we, you know, beyond words, beyond the pandemic, through the pandemic, addressing it. And then, you know, Black Lives Matter, that's always been there as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> you know, it's been an ongoing, it's never, it's like native rights. Well, it never, you know, in the public, it, it comes above the surface and then it emerges, submerges again. It's always been there. But still, here we are, you know, like what we saw when we were go growing up, Rita, you know, these, these yeah. kinds of protests or, you know, vocalizations, mass vocalizations of, oh, wait, we're human beings. We did, you know, we're human beings. We just like human beings. You know? Yeah. So poetry has been, so once again, like in the time, you know, you were a poet laureate, that poetry is, is so, so important. And now in the middle of it, we get the, my tribe, uh, tribal nation gets the, uh, a landmark ruling in for all of it's been the most man, landmark ruling in all of Indian country for McGirt versus Oklahoma. And so then that's another, you know, it's something else. So we're thinking about, well, and, and, and I think about it for the country too, it's like, okay, we're in this. So it, this to me marks a time of great cultural, I won't say revolution, that word is loaded, but re, regeneration. Yeah. And that's how I see it. Okay, this is a time. I mean, I when I think of American culture, I don't see natives much in it, but I see, I think American culture is heavily African American culture. The expression of it, at least the way I you know, understand it, but it, it belongs, it's part of all of us. We don't see natives much, but we're part of it. And this is the time where we say, okay, you know, it's falling apart, the wound is open. So where do we go? And poetry is, I think, one of the, in the art, in our arts is the best place because that's where we get to the place beyond what, beyond our, our small thinking too much minds mm -hmm. possible. So this laureateship has been kind of a wild ride because, you know, there's, you know, the first native all these years. Yeah. And then this decision, the pandemic and, it's been pretty, it's been, it's been very, it's intense for everybody, but it's an opportunity. Yeah. yeah and I, I'm excited to talk to you both and to um, reflect on your laureateships, uh, not only because you're such good friends, such old friends, but because you mark the sort of uh, beginning and the present of the activist laureateship. So Rita, you came in um, and really heralded in this new era of laureates taking on projects, engaging with the public. That had happened in certain ways before. Uh, when I first showed up a decade ago at the library, people were still talking about how great it was to have Gwendolyn Brooks here and what she did when she yeah. was in the office. But in terms of national projects, in terms of going out and connecting to the country as a whole, you were the first laureate to do that. Uh, can you talk about where you got that idea and how it worked out? Well, you know, I didn't have to get the idea. The idea was there and it was kind of, uh, people just told me, you know, that that's what they needed. When I was, when Dr. Billington called me and asked me, to be poet laureate, I was in Chicago. I had just done a, a, a reading and a couple of days with Gwendolyn Brooks and, uh, you know, serendipitously enough. And mm -hmm. I saw how she connected, you know, with people and how she always brought them, you know, did not have any kind of screens up. It was always a mm -hmm. connection heart to heart. And so what, when he asked me, I realized, I mean, first of all, I was the, one of the youngest, if, if not the youngest at that time. And I, and I felt that it was a clarion call. I mean, I felt like there's nothing else. You're, you're supposed to do something. I mean, you have energy, you're, you're younger than all the others, you've got to do something. And before I even had a chance to think about what to do, 
people began to write me and say, this is what, you know, this is what you should do, or this is what poetry is. Now, the thing I found so interesting, people would often start a letter, and these are not people, these are not professors, so these are pizza deliverers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. They would write in and say, I don't know much about poetry, I'm afraid of poetry, I don't know what it means, but, and they, they would follow some of the most beautiful descriptions of the first well, poem that, you know, that they read. That, that really moved them. So I realized this is what we need. And there was nothing else to be done but to go out there and, and say poetry is, is a wonderful thing, just to be present. So I, I was um, considered an activist poet, but to me, that was the only way to be. This is the way I've lived my life. And, uh, you know, that's what I'm just going to keep doing it. I don't know. And Joy, when you started your laureateship, we began by talking about what might be possible for you to do as a project. And I know you had this idea in mind from the get-go. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about the, the genesis of that, of the idea of, of the project we've announced uh, recently. Yes, I had all kinds of ideas. I wanted to do everything. <laughs> you know, I wanted to work, you know, go back, go into every Native community for one. I wanted to go into... Uh, back, uh, it work with children. I mean, I had all kinds of projects, but what always comes up is that a lot of, you know, at the same time of the laureateship, a study came out. Uh, uh, I think it was Kellogg Finance Study. The first time that we had figures and data on the images of natives in America. And a lot of people think we're dead or they think that uh, their image, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it, it's, it was really astounding. You know, they think that we're invisible. We don't appear. We are not at the table at most. You know, you don't see us generally at the Academy Award or any of the, you don't see us. We're not present in the American narrative, however that narrative unfolds. So the project came about thinking about that. And uh, um, I have an anthology coming out any minute from Norton. Um, uh, when the light of the world was subdued, our songs came through, a Native Nations historical poetry anthology. So I thought, why not do a map to show that one, we're still here at indigenous peoples. We're still very living and we're astronauts. We, we, uh, we do everything. We clean houses, we teach, we, we're everybody. We bull riders. I always remember James Welch saying he's a writer because he couldn't write bulls. <laughs> you know, the, we're all, we're all of these people, and yet we're lot, many poets. I think there's over 160 poets in this anthology. So we're doing constructing a map digitally. It would be good to people work digitally to have access to it. And so we right now, I think we have about 50, over 50 poets who will be featured and their voices featured and images all over the U.S. and showing where they live. Like these are human beings. Mm -hmm. It comes to that, you know, we're human beings. And I remember when I was a student at Iowa thinking, if I do anything with poetry, I want people to know that we're human beings. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so this project, it's, it's exciting. And then Norton came along and worked, uh, we're gonna do a, a small handbook anthology of a short, you know, 50 some poets, uh, living nations, living poets that will, um, come out of the project. Of course, I wanted to go everywhere, but I'm doing that anyway. And I've been doing that for years, traveling about to all kinds of communities, you know, all over. I mean, I've done everything from um, play, play, uh, you know, I've been all over to all kinds of communities for years. So I'm kind of, I'm doing, continuing, except I'm doing it virtually now, like you are and um, still doing, that's still very much a part of it. Yeah, it makes sense that the very uh, um, work you talked about, Rita, um, feeling called to do, uh, Joy, you are continuing to do with the complement of this great, wonderful uh, project. Mm -hmm. I'm thrilled to have you both here. I'm thrilled to be able to present you to uh, uh, our National Book Festival uh, viewers as part of our 20th anniversary book festival. And I'm grateful to you both for your uh, commitment to and uh, service on behalf of poetry. So thanks so much for being 
Wonderful, wonderful Poets Laureate, and thanks so much for being together with us uh, today. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, for all the hard work you do over there and, my, and everyone in that office. Thank you. Yeah, I thank you. You have changed the, lot, the, the scene of, of poetry and literature in this country. So thank you so much. It was wonderful to be here. Great to see you, Joy. Yeah, great to see you, too. <laughs>